we find bustling cities and uh, and rivers and vegetation or uh, possibly not. And uh, the former is what we found. So we found really a very dry uh, desert, dusty planet um, that had clearly been shaped by billions of years of wind. Uh, the Mariner uh, spacecraft observed dust activity. They observed dunes on the surface. Um, and they were also able to give us more atmospheric data and they confirmed the low atmospheric density that had been uh, predicted by earlier telescope observations. Okay, so now that we know that the Mart Martian atmosphere was uh, incredibly uh, thin, 100 times thinner than Earth, we can take a, a look at that fluid threshold equation that I mentioned. Um, and if we plug in the parameters for, for Mars's gravity and atmospheric density, what we come up with is that winds need to be 10 times higher on the surface of Mars to mobilize sand. So this would be like hurricane force winds would be needed um, to, to move sand grains on the surface because the atmosphere is so thin, um, it's, it's much weaker than it is here on Earth. So this raised a, a major question uh, for a lot of people uh, about whether or not modern winds would actually be able to achieve these high wind speeds, or if potentially the dunes that they saw on the surface were just relics of, uh, of an ancient paleoclimate that had a denser atmosphere that looked a lot more like Earth. Um, and so this was kind of an outstanding question um, and we needed to figure out a way to, to answer this. So we didn't have any wind measurements on the surface. Um, so we couldn't kind of take wind measurements and say, okay, that's above the fluid threshold. We know that we have sand moving. Um, instead, we had to be a little bit creative. And so what we uh, did was what's called change detection imaging. And so this is gonna pop up a lot in this talk. Um, and so this, this idea is that we can take one image um, of a patch of the surface, and then we can take an identical image uh, a given amount of time later, and then we can compare those two to each other and see if the dunes on the surface have moved. If they have, then we have evidence of sand movement, and uh, thus we think that we are achieving those fluid thresholds. So we did this, um, we did this for many decades, and no images showed uh, conclusive dune movement across the surface. So these are two uh, examples of studies that were done um, using uh, change detection imaging, and they were not able to, to conclusively say that anything was moving on the surface. So why was this? Was this because our predictions were correct and these were actually inactive today um, and they were really just features that had formed long, long ago when the atmosphere was denser and more capable of mobilizing sand? Uh, or did we lack the, the necessary data and the necessary resolution to actually be able to observe these changes on the surface? Okay, so we're wrapping up the, the first category, the past orbital. So in this category, we were looking at things as sort of spatial scale of meters to kilometers and temporal scale of months to years. That's, that's sort of the, the images were taken at those resolutions and, and that's what we were working with. Using this, we were able to determine that there were in fact sand dunes across the surface, uh, but we were not able to determine if they were active or if they were relics of an ancient paleoclimate. So how are we gonna answer this question? Well, we need to send better orbiters. Um, so we uh, continued to do this. And in particular, we sent uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment or High Rise Camera, um, which is an incredibly, uh, it has an incredible spatial resolution of 25 centimeters per pixel, which means that you could resolve a human uh, lying down on the surface of Mars. Um, and so this uh, camera really brought the surface into focus and turned images like this into images like this, uh, which I think is a pretty uh, stunning comparison. And, and the amount of detail that you can see in this image is really uh, breathtaking. These are exactly the same dune field. Uh, this is the Olympia Unde dune field in uh, the northern high latitudes. Um, and it's actually a, a very large dune field. It goes, uh, goes around the entire circumference of the planet. Um, but it's really incredible the amount of detail that you can get once you uh, increase the resolution of your cameras. So just because I love uh, these images and, uh, and love the way dunes look on Mars, I wanted to show a couple more. So these are also high-rise images. And uh, I actually recommend that uh, everyone go to the high rise website and just browse the images that this camera takes because they're uh, pretty incredible and 
uh, on numerous occasions, I've actually printed out uh, images of these dune fields and hung them up in uh, in my office and at home as artwork. So uh, they're multi-purpose, they're science and art, um, but I think they're absolutely beautiful and uh, they actually really hold a lot of information about uh, the geologic and the climatic history, as I said. Uh, the, the shape and the size of dune fields tells you a lot about the environmental conditions on the surface. So even just looking at these images can give us a lot of information um, from orbit that we wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, but would this camera help us actually detect motion in dunes? That was kind of the remaining question. Well, indeed it did. Um, it took a, a little bit of time. Um, the high-rise camera had to be in orbit for a long enough amount of time uh, for dunes to, to migrate uh, across the surface enough to be detected. Um, but in fact, it did. And um, we have now observed dune motion across the surface of Mars. Um, so these are just two examples of that, um, but there's numerous examples in many different kinds of locations. Uh, and these are moving on sort of monthly and yearly timescales. Uh, but because we're still in orbit for these images, uh, we're looking at these big, uh, these large scale changes of, of those kind of kilometer scale dunes. Um, and we can only get uh, images every couple months or maybe every couple years. Um, and so it's hard to kind of resolve the, the small scale processes that are going on um, on the surface to, uh, to cause this change. And it's, it's hard to tell from orbit whether or not the, the sand motion is kind of gradual due to background circulation patterns, or if it's really during kind of large uh, dust storm events, these rare meteorological events, uh, when people predict that, that winds uh, are probably the strongest on the surface. Um, so we can't get that any more information from orbit, and we really need to take a look at the smaller bed forms from the surface. So wrapping up our orbital section, uh, we've gone from scales of kind of meters to kilometers to tens of centimeters. Um, and that has allowed us to determine that sand dunes are indeed active under current climatic conditions on monthly and yearly timescales. Uh, but again, we're left with this question of, of whether uh, background winds are achieving those wind speeds that are uh, able to move sand, or if it's really during these kind of rare episodic events that all of the sand is being moved. So we go to the surface to answer this question. Um, the Viking landers were the first uh, landers on the surface, um, and they included they uh, had wind sensors that were able to take some wind measurements for uh, I think uh, about 45 sols or so, and then uh, and then they uh, they broke. But but for a bit they were able to give us some wind data, um, and subsequent landers and rovers were also able to provide um, some wind data with varying uh, degrees of, of accuracy and, and time. Um, this, the image on the right, the WINSOC uh, experiment was uh, included on Mars Pathfinder. Um, and it was basically this little thing that hung off the side and we would image it and, and try to determine the wind from, from its movement. Um, but overall, the kind of picture that you get from uh, the wind data that was provided by early, uh, early landers um, was that the fluid threshold was really not being achieved. Uh, maybe on one or two instances, we were getting up above that, uh, that threshold, uh, but generally winds were much lower, about half the speed that would be required to move sand. So this was kind of adding to the uh, idea that maybe sand movement on Mars was really rare and was occurring really just during these, uh, these global dust storms. Um, so the Viking lander did observe um, sand motion on the surface, um, or I should say it was actually on its lander deck. It, in place, uh, it placed a, a pile of sand on the deck to see if they could observe it move. Um, and indeed they did over about a hundred sols. Uh, sol, is a, sol is a Martian day. Um, and so you can see in these images, it's sort of hard to tell, but you can see that some of the sand has moved in between that time period. Um, but it's we don't have any information about what occurred between those two times. So again, we don't know if this was multiple instances of sand movement or if this was all in one big gust. Um, and having a pile on the lander deck is actually technically not really uh, representative of, of uh, sediment moving on the surface for, for a couple of reasons. So this is sort of an imperfect experiment. Um, but it did uh, kind of make people excited that maybe things were moving and that maybe we would be able to observe uh, things on the surface moving. So we did actually see changes on the surface itself uh, in a couple instances. 
Um, but they were all confined to, uh, to dust storm events. So uh, on the left here, we've got um, images from the Viking lander. Um, and after about five years on the surface, it finally saw changes uh, in, in the sand around the uh, sand around a lander uh, during one of these dust storm events. Uh, and on the right, we saw we see um, ripple uh, migration that was seen by the Mer rover. Um, and this was actually the first ripple migration seen from the surface, which is pretty cool. Um, but this was also during a dust storm event. Um, so again, we're kind of getting this idea that that maybe these dust storm events are the major drivers of, of sand in motion on Mars. Uh, but these dust storm events can also be uh, threatening, uh, and dust activity in general can be threatening. Um, the solar panels on uh, on the Mer Opportunity rover um, were covered and actually uncovered at various times uh, across uh, the mission, um, as you can see in those images at the top. Um, and as many of you probably know, uh, the Opportunity um, rover mission actually ended due to a global dust storm uh, that obscured the sun and um, and the rover ran out of power. Um, so these really are important uh, processes to understand um, and show that that uh, these dust storms can be um, really influential on the surface. Okay, so now we're at uh, on the surface and we're looking at things on a scale of centimeters moving per day or per week. Um, so we've really increased our resolution uh, quite well. Um, and now we know that um, there does seem to be sand activity on the surface, but it does seem to be confined mostly to dust storms. Um, so we didn't know if sand could be active not during dust storms, um, potentially in other locations on the surface, um, or potentially if our, if our observations weren't good enough to capture it. Um, we hadn't quite answered this question. It seemed like mostly everything was happening during dust storms. Um, but uh, people were still curious if background circulation patterns could do it as well. OK, so now we're getting into ongoing surface missions. So um, these are uh, the spacecraft that I work on. Um, the MSL Curiosity rover landed in Gale Crater on Mars uh, in 2002. Gale Crater is uh, an 155 kilometer uh, impact crater just south of the um, uh, to topographic dichotomy, and um, it's got a five kilometer high mountain in the middle, um, which is called Mount Sharp, and that was the rover's destination. Um, and you can also see in this orbital image that uh, there are these dark dunes uh, kind of across the crater floor. Um, and so we were going to have to traverse through these dunes uh, to get to our destination of Mount Sharp. Now, the rover was equipped with a couple things that could help us understand wind. Um, it had imagers with a range of resolutions, so we could do change detection imaging like we had done uh, with previous missions. Um, but it also had a wind sensor, um, the Remote Environmental Monitoring Station, or REMS instrument. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the REMS instrument here. It's got two booms, um, and it, it really needs both to accurately measure wind, uh, and one of them uh, promptly broke upon landing. So uh, that was a little bit of a disappointment and uh, meant that wind data had to be kind of carefully considered, um, but was, was gonna be an issue. So instead, we really were gonna rely on our change detection experiments to probe the wind like we've done before. Uh, luckily, the Curiosity rover makes uh, very periodic stops uh, for drilling and, and other uh, science activities and, and solar conjunction. Um, so it's often stopping along its traverse, which uh, gives a good opportunity to do change detection imaging. So again, the idea behind this is that we can look at ripples on the surface, uh, take two images that are spaced a couple days apart or closer, uh, and see if these ripples moved in that time. Um, so this can be done across the entire mission. It has been done across the entire mission um, and allows us to, to probe the direction and the strength of the wind, um, as well as how winds change with season and time of day. Um, so the, the dunes on the surface um, that we see from orbit, we didn't know if these were actually active uh, before the rover landed on Mars. Uh, but soon after landing, um, orbital images confirmed that they indeed were active. Um, so these are two, uh, two GIFs showing um, orbital images taken uh, of dunes within the Bagnall dune field. Um, so this was pretty exciting because it meant that um, we had a rover on the surface in a potentially active aeolian environment um, and might have the chance to really study these processes uh, in situ for the first time. 
So the first stop we made in the dune field um, was uh, during local winter. Um, and this is the first time humans have ever gotten to explore uh, an active dune field on another planet, which in itself I think is pretty incredible. Um, but we were really excited to take change detection images and see if we could see uh, ripples moving on the surface. Um, so we did this over a number of weeks. Um, and if you watch this movie playthrough, you'll see pretty much nothing. Um, we didn't see any ripples moving on the surface, uh, which was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, and, and people were trying to figure out, well, it, does this mean that these dunes are also only active during uh, uh, large scale dust storms um, or is something else going on here? Uh, but we weren't able to, to get any information about the winds that were actually forming these dunes. Uh, luckily, we got another shot at this uh, about one Earth year later. Um, so now we were in a, a local summer on Mars, um, which had been previously predicted uh, for a long time to be particularly windy, um, the, a windy season uh, on Mars. And so we were excited to see if maybe this time we would be able to observe ripples. Um, and I'll just mention uh, as a little aside, uh, the second REMS boom actually broke uh, during this campaign when it got hit by a sand particle. Um, so I think this was another example of the dangers uh, of Aeolian processes on landed instruments. Um, but this time we got lucky. We were able to observe uh, ripples migrating every day on the surface. Um, so a really active environment and very different from what we saw the first time around. Um, so in each of these images, you can see impact ripples uh, migrating kind of millimeters per day. Um, and, uh, and this was a really exciting thing and helped us uh, determine that background winds in this location were able to produce uh, ripple movement, which was really surprising um, and was kind of the first the first observation of this on Mars. Uh, but that wasn't the only exciting thing that we found in the dune field. Um, we also found an entirely new type of Aeolian bed form that uh, doesn't exist on Earth. Um, so this image is an image that was taken as we approached uh, our initial stop in the dune field. Um, and here we can see uh, we've got uh, the large dunes, and then we've got small uh, ripples similar to what we have here on Earth that I highlighted on uh, earlier in the talk. But we have this third type of bed form that's intermediate to those two um, that are sort of these large ripple looking things. Um, and so these do not exist on Earth um, and we had never seen them before. And now a lot of research has been going into figuring out what these are, uh, how do they form, and and does their existence uh, kind of influence our own understanding of, of wind even on our planet. Um, and so these features are really cool. We can see them from orbit uh, in a lot of different locations across the surface of Mars. Um, and as I said, we can see them from the surface, um, at least in Gale Crater. Um, and so these are uh, a topic of, of debate right now, and there's actually a, a lot of different hypotheses as to how these form. Um, but it was pretty cool that we actually got uh, to look at these from the surface, um, and now we can see them across the surface and can try to, to figure out um, how they form in these environments. Okay, so we've now uh, gotten to our ongoing surface missions, uh, which have brought us down to looking at, at things changing on the scale of millimeters per day. Um, but I want to ask, can we do better than that? Can we increase our resolution even more with this mission? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, it took a little bit of, uh, of creativity, but we, uh, we figured out a way to do it. So we realized that uh, if we were going to take multiple images in one day, uh, we were no longer going to be able to track those ripples on the surface because uh, tracking ripples is... Uh, it requires a constant illumination angle, so you have to take images at the same time every day. Um, if we were going to be taking five images on one day, then the sun is going to be changing illumination angle. We were no longer going to be able to track those ripples. Um, so instead, what we did was we had to track the, uh, the movement of sand around uh, and on bedrock regions. So uh, the sand on Mars is very dark and bedrock is often much lighter, um, so we can observe these changes uh, regardless of the illumination of the sun. So these are uh, the same shots I showed before, but now I'm showing um, basically two full day cycles. So we've got a, a, 
an early image and a late image on uh, two different days. And what you'll see if you try to watch where I've uh, put those circles is that there's really no sand movement during the daytime period. So between about six in the morning to 1800, there's uh, no real changes in the sand uh, around the bedrock. But uh, in the nighttime periods between 1800 and 600 the next day, we see large scale changes in those sand populations. So we were able to determine from these experiments um, that the strongest winds in Gale Crater occur during the nighttime uh, in spring and summer. And so we were able to determine the season that it occurs and the time of day that it occurs, uh, which was a pretty exciting thing. So here we've gone from days to hours, uh, which is great. Um, but I'm gonna ask again, just because I like to, can we do even better? Um, and it turns out we can. Um, although this is with a, a different camera, uh, now we're going to be using the Mars hand lens imager, the Molly camera, uh, which has an incredibly high uh, resolution of like 16 microns uh, per pixel, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so often these, the, this camera takes uh, kind of focus stack images of a close up of the surface. Uh, and in between these individual images, it has actually captured uh, movement of sand grains on the surface. So these images are showing. Uh, actual individual sand grains moving uh, on a scale of kind of seconds to minutes. Uh, on the left is actually uh, on second scales and it's a, a wind gust that, that comes through um, and you get kind of 10 seconds of movement of those sand grains. Um, but I think this is a pretty incredible thing just to look at uh, if you think about going to the beach and how small those sand grains are, uh, to think about the fact that you're looking at those sand grains uh, this close on another planet, I think is just uh, an incredible thing. And I think this camera, um, yeah, this camera just really blows my mind. <laughs> okay, so moving on a little bit, switching gears. Um, the Curiosity River also uh, gave us an opportunity to observe the inside of a dust storm uh, for, for the first time, really. Um, and uh, so the, the same dust storm that hit Opportunity, as you can see in the, in the map on the left, uh, eventually did make its way to Gale Crater. Um, so we were able to, to take some observations from the surface since, uh, since we were not solar powered, we didn't have to cease operations. Um, and there were a number of, of orbiters uh, that were ready to study the storm, uh, but the Curiosity rover was the only one to do that on the surface. Um, and so this was really important because uh, as I mentioned before, there's been a lot of speculation about the, the winds associated with uh, dust storms and how the wind conditions change during a dust storm. Um, some people think that it, uh, the winds really ramp up and that you get a lot of surface activity. Uh, other people actually think that um, because you're uh, decreasing the solar insulation you get at the surface when there's more dust in the air, uh, that actually thermally driven thermally driven winds will um, will be less uh, less strong during a dust storm. So this was kind of an, an ongoing question, and we were um, excited to see if we could obtain any data uh, one way or the other. So these are some images of when the dust storm arrived in the crater. Um, on the right, you can see uh, usually we can see the crater rim. Um, even these are a little bit dusty. Usually it's pretty clear, and you can see the crater rim. Um, but then it, it, when the storm comes in, in about the third panel, it gets uh, very red and orange and you can no longer see the crater rim. Uh, on the left, we can see how the illumination changes. Also, uh, illumination conditions changed uh, around the rover. Um, the, the red when the, when the storm arrives is kind of uh, scarily uh, reminiscent of, of some of the images that I've seen of, of California and Oregon recently. Um, but you can see that the dust in the atmosphere really changes your illumination conditions a lot. So we were actually doing a, a drill campaign when the uh, when the dust storm arrived. Um, and so these are change detection images that we took uh, when when the storm was approaching. Um, and you can see that the the drill tailings and uh, the sand around the drill um, are both moving um, over this this day. So the winds do seem to be, strong enough to, to move this material, um, similar to things we've seen before at this time of year. Uh, but I will say, I think they are likely not strong enough uh, to move an antenna on the surface. Um, so this is my little clip from the Martian uh, that I always like to use. Um, it's it's uh, Hollywood, so I will um, cut them some slack, but um, 
I do not think that this is what the winds look like on the surface uh, during a dust storm. If they did, we would have seen far more movement in the images on the left. Um, so I will say that the, the winds are strong enough to move sand, but not uh, strong enough to move an antenna. Okay. So here we are back at our uh, our kind of evolution of uh, progress. Um, and now we've gone even further down to tens of microns um, and looking at things on kind of scale of seconds to minutes. Um, and what have we been able to determine uh, kind of progressing through, uh, through this and increasing our capabilities? Uh, we now know that at least in some locations, um, regular background winds are capable of moving sand on a daily basis, um, which if you had said to somebody, I think uh, 40, even 30 years ago, um, they wouldn't have believed you. So I think it's it, we've come a long way. Um, however, we still don't know what wind speed is actually driving this activity. So this is sort of an ongoing question. Um, so Enter Insight, um, which is our most recent spacecraft that landed on Mars in, in late 2018. Uh, on the left, you see the spacecraft on the surface. On the right, you see me and my father at the uh, Insight landing uh, celebration out at JPL. Uh, the lander was equipped with a high frequency wind sensor, so even better than, uh, than what was on MSL. It was basically uh, modeled the same, but increased capabilities. Um, and this was called the twin sensor. Uh, and we had imagers. Um, so we were excited to see, would we finally be able to crack this code? Would we finally be able to understand what these wind speeds are on the surface? Unfortunately, no. Uh, Mars never seems to cooperate. Um, we have great wind data on the surface, uh, but we have no sand to study. Um, and so there's some, there's different hypotheses as to why this is. Um, it may just be that this, uh, this area is not, uh, particularly, uh, it has had aeolian um, and an aeolian history, but it doesn't have uh, ripples and dunes the way we see other locations on Mars have. Um, so it's possible that it's just a, 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 a property of the geology of the landing site, uh, or as, as you can see on the right, um, it's possible that our uh, we blew away all the, the sand we wanted to study when we landed. Um, you can see the the dark um, area around the lander where we've blown away uh, sand and dust. So it's possible that it, it was our own fault, uh, but either way, uh, we were not able to, to study sand ripples on the surface in uh, simultaneously with the wind data that we were collecting. Oh, but uh, we were able to hear wind on Mars for the first time. Um, so this is uh, a recording that was made using uh, the seismometers, actually. So this isn't actually audible wind, uh, but it's um, the wind-driven vibrations recorded by the seismometer. Um, and I'll play it again and not talk through it. Um, I like to, to, to play this as uh, I feel like you can kind of immerse yourself in the experience and imagine yourself standing on the surface of Mars uh, and, and hearing this wind. Anyways, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I think there's longer recordings online if people want to hear them. Um, but I was always interested if somebody could use this to, to determine something about the, the, uh, the wind speed around the, the lander, but um, yet to be determined. Um, OK, so here we are again at what we've learned. We have one major outstanding question right now. Um, despite all the sand motion that we've seen, um, and we see it all over Mars now, and uh, Curiosity has seen it uh, repeatedly every spring and summer along the traverse. Um, the wind data that we currently have from the surface, including the winds, uh, the wind data from InSight, which is uh, very high frequency, and um, and we have it over uh, almost an entire Mars year now, are not reaching those fluid thresholds that we thought we needed to mobilize sand. So, how is this occurring? Um, how do we reconcile this? If we go back to our equation, um, our original fluid threshold equation, as I said, uh, winds we thought would need to be 10 times higher than here on Earth to mobilize sand. Um, they are not reaching that speed. So how do we understand the widespread sand motion we see? Uh, either we need uh, more high frequency wind data from the surface, potentially in other locations that uh, have more aeolian activity going on. Um, and so again, maybe that's just a lack of, of data that we, we need to, um, to improve. Or perhaps our fundamental understanding of this equation 
isn't quite right um, and doesn't work the way we would expect it to work on another planet. So how could our equations be wrong? That seems uh, kind of contrary to our understanding of science. Um, but I think it's important to understand that we, at least in this case, these equations were made to fit our understanding of what we saw on Earth, um, which is unintentionally always going to be biased by the environment that we have here on our planet, both the gravity and atmospheric density. Um, and so although we have those parameters included in the equation, um, it may be hidden in constants or in, in other ways that we don't quite understand. And so this is why kind of exploring another planet uh, with different uh, environmental conditions is really important for understanding the fundamental physics of these processes. So recently, uh, people have been doing a lot of work here on Earth um, to understand uh, if these equations are correct and how we might be missing something in them. Um, the, the little chamber on the left is, uh, is uh, an experiment that somebody made that I think is pretty incredible. They put this chamber uh, into parabolic flight uh, to simulate Martian gravity um, and then uh, replicated the wind tunnel experiments that, uh, that have been done before. Um, and the, uh, the video on the right shows uh, actually walnut shells um, being um, uh, transported in, in a wind tunnel. Um, and again, that was to kind of simulate Martian conditions. These, um, these studies and others have uh, recently showed us that maybe the fluid threshold on Mars is actually lower than predicted. Um, or alternatively, maybe wind, uh, maybe Mars, uh, sand is able to move on Mars below this fluid threshold in uh, in a different way. If you can, if the gravity is lower, you can kind of sustain motion easier. Um, and so these, these and others have kind of uh, led to this awakening about these equations. Um, but in order to actually test these theories, we really need those, that in situ wind data um, and simultaneous observations of ripples moving on the surface. So going back to where we started, um, these are our Earth videos. Um, and uh, I kind of wanted to ask, have we gotten to where we were hoping to get? Um, so we've got our Earth, we've got our simulated Mars on Earth, and then we've got our Mars videos. Um, and I would say that although we haven't quite gotten there, uh, we're getting pretty close. I think it's uh, with this as a goal, we have, uh, have done our best to, to simulate Martian conditions here on Earth and to take images as uh, frequently and as high resolution as we can on Mars. Uh, there's still a lot to be discovered, but I do think that it's pretty incredible to see kind of how far we've come um, since exploration of Mars began. And then I will just end with uh, looking towards the future. Um, Mars 2020 is obviously on its way to Mars right now, um, and we'll have uh, the capabilities, I think, to, to hopefully answer some of these questions. Um, it will have a wind sensor very similar to the ones that were on MSL and InSight. Um, and it will also have, uh, have a, a camera, multiple cameras actually, um, that are um, also kind of copies of what were on MSL. Um, but this time they're actually gonna have movie capabilities. Um, so that increases the likelihood of being able to watch uh, some of this sand motion in action. Uh, the landing site does appear to have aeolian bed forms, so we're hopeful that it'll be a good um, surface condition for, for studying wind. Um, and actually, it will have a microphone, so we will actually hear the first real audio recordings of wind on Mars. Although InSight gave us a sort of uh, mock audio version, we, we're going to get uh, actually be able to hear the wind is on Mars for the first time. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then as a kind of uh, cool aside, um, and sort of a, an example of the innovation of, of some Mars scientists. I have heard rumblings that, that people might try to use uh, the quadcopter that was uh, sent with uh, Mars 2020 to kind of create a, a little wind experiment uh, where you use the, uh, the fins to, to make wind and then you observe sand moving on the surface. Um, and so I don't know if that will really happen, but it's uh, sort of an exciting idea and, and shows kind of um, how creative people can be kind of solving these problems. So we're all excited to see uh, what 2020 will, will discover and I hope everyone uh, will tune in for that. And uh, that's all I have. So I'm happy to take questions. Wow, Mariah, that is really cool. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you think so. <laughs> Sometimes cool. I tell people I study yeah, sand I, grains on Mars and they look at me kind of funny, but. <laughs> you know. 
Yeah. Uh, so there have been a, a there have been a number of questions that have come through the chat, and normally I like to just turn the floor over to the folks who posted the questions to ask, but there are a few that are sort of in the same vein, and I'm going to take um, you know uh, take privilege and sort of um, uh, bunch a couple of these together. So there um, there were some questions around the size density uh of the sand particles and whether and using those to calculate speed so for example okay. are the martian sand grains the same size as they are on earth um if you know the particle size and density can't you use that to calculate some wind speed or get some some idea of of that uh someone else noted that there seemed to be greater differences in the size of sand particles on Mars. And now does that tell you anything about the size of the wind at the time of the recorded movement? So I mean, I'm bunching a few things together here, but. Okay, yes, let me try to tackle those. So um, sand grains do vary in size. Um, and so they, uh, there is, I thought I had included here the the typical size of, of sand grains and uh, on Earth and Mars, but it looks like I didn't. So. Um, the, the sand grain size is roughly comparable. Um, the density is a little bit different uh, on, on Mars. We were usually looking at uh, basaltic sand grains, so they're a little bit higher density, uh, which would make them a little bit uh, harder to move. Um, the, there are, there's a range in grain sizes. So these are incredible questions, by the way, um, and all things that we think about as researchers. Um, so bed forms on both Earth and Mars can show a wide range in grain sizes, which makes determining these wind speeds really difficult. Um, and in, in fact, there's actually um, what are called mega ripples, uh, which are when uh, they're ripples that look similar to the large ripples we have on, on uh, Mars. And people actually thought when we saw them originally, oh, maybe those are mega ripples because we have those on Earth. Uh, but mega ripples have coarser grains uh, at the crest than typical. So um, typical grain size, sand grain sizes are about 100 microns. So that's one tenth of a millimeter. Um, and that's sort of just a standard, uh, standard grain size. But uh, mega ripples can have up to one millimeter, um, even larger grain sizes than that. And so these are, um, and actually this, um, let me show the video in uh, here in Great Sand Dunes. Um, this is actually, I didn't mention this, but this is a mega ripple on the right. And so you can see it, it's hard to tell, um, but these grains here are actually much uh, coarser than, uh, than the typical aeolian sand. And so uh, typical aeolian sand actually kind of uh, saltates, which means that it's more flying in the air and it's what you can see in the background. These particles that are kind of moving slowly along the surface are um, much larger and aren't able to be lifted up by the wind because they're so big. Um, but all of these things play a kind of key role in determining what wind speed is required um, to move these um, these features and is things that we take into account all the time. Um, and so on Mars, we use the hand lens imager to get a closer look at those uh, at those individual sand grains and actually measure what they are. Um, it's very hard to kind of uh, create a uh, an equation that can predict uh, aeolian activity using a, a wide range of grain sizes. Um, you usually have to kind of pick one and, and hope that it works. Um, but obviously that will influence uh, whether or not a, a wind can can move a, fe a feature. I don't know if I got all the questions, but hopefully some of them. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think you did. Um, so a couple of other than, uh, you know, angles on that. Um, Cal Powell, one of our members is, um, he's a meteorite collector, uh, among other things. But he's asking if the earthbound studies use Martian soil simulant, since we know what's there. Cal, anything else you want to elaborate at all? or? You may have to go off. I have, to, I have to unmute. Yep. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there's this Martian soil simulant. And so the question is uh, they usually use that to study how uh, rovers would operate on the surface of Mars and whether that stuff would get into any of the crevices there. And so I'm just wondering if that is used for those studies. And conversely, 
are your studies from Mars uh, used to um, uh, help us refine how to make Martian soil simulant here on Earth? Oh, good question. Um, so for the first part, um, do you, I don't actually know much about the simulant soil. I don't know if it's more sort of dust particle size um, and if that's what they're trying to, uh, to simulate, uh, how dust kind of attaches to instruments. Um, I don't know if you know that by any chance. I have a little uh, a vial of what looks like normal regolith. So uh, um, that's all I know. Well, then I'm sure I don't do experimental studies, um, but I'm sure that uh, that folks have used that. Um, as I said at the end there, people also use, people use a whole kind of uh, range of things, including walnut shells um, to sort of simulate the, the uh, gravity differences. And uh, there's some issues. I mean, nothing is really perfect. It's hard to, um, Walnut shells obviously aren't perfectly spherical, um, and so you're getting uh, you're going to have some issues with kind of trying to replicate sand in that way. Um, it's a good question. I don't actually know, uh, but I would assume people are, are using that if they have access to it. Um, in terms of whether or not our uh, observations are um, impacting the simulants, um, I don't know. I would assume so. Um, although I heard an interesting uh, talk recently that I was sort of curious about uh, because it was, uh, it sort of was saying that there's a difference uh, chemically and mineralogically between what's considered Martian regolith um, and what's considered sand. Um, and so I guess I hadn't really been aware of that. I think um, I study sand so much that I sort of assumed that was the surface material people were talking about. But regolith really has a much larger component of dust in it. Um, and so I think that they're different in that sense. Um, but I'm sure, I know there are people on the MSL uh, team that take observations of, of regolith. Um, and, and so I'm sure that they use that information somehow to, to kind of uh, uh, adjust the, the simulants that we're using here on Earth. So Mariah, another question uh, from Jeff Kretsch, uh, and Jeff, pardon me if I mispronounced your name, but he's asking, you know, well, we've, we've experienced this, you know, um, at, at the beach and other places, sand develops electrostatic properties uh, as it's moving. Could electrostatic forces be playing a role in, in this uh, unexpected motion? Yes, so um, I would say that it is um, it is likely not playing a role in sand motion, but it is um, often thought of as a possible explanation for dust movement. Um, so I didn't get into all the kind of technical details, but uh, technically, if you plot that fluid threshold curve uh, on a computer or anything, um, you will actually see that uh, that the the wind speeds required to move dust are predicted to be much higher than what's required to move sand. Um, so in fact, moving sand on the surface is one thing, moving dust on the surface is a whole nother problem that people are trying to figure out. Um, and oftentimes the electrostatic um, kind of environment that uh, that comes along with dust activity is thought of as one possible explanation for how to uh, to mobilize dust on the surface. Um, there have been other explanations. Some people think that uh, that the movement of sand uh, will uh, eject dust, um, and so if you if you just have sand moving, um, then you can get dust lifted into the atmosphere. Um, some people think that that dust devils are the primary source of of uh, dust lifting, but even in a dust devil, it's kind of uh, still uncertain what exactly is doing uh, the lifting of the particle. Um, and so there's all sorts of uh, questions surrounding this, but I do think that the electrostatics could be playing a role for for dust lifting in particular. Okay. And then a question I had when you showed one when you were showing some of your your images from from orbit, but even the one you're on here now, on the left-hand image where you show the ripples. Mm -hmm. um, is there a relationship between wind speed and the spacing of the ripples? Can, you know, I, I, it can't be, you know, can't be the first time you've heard this one. Yeah, I, well, so, it, no, and I'm laughing because these are all the same questions that we ask as researchers. Um, so there's a lot of debate about what actually controls the wavelength 
<clears throat> the wavelength of ripples. Um, some think that it might be the grain size. Um, and so when you have larger grain sizes, like on mega ripples, you can form uh, ripples that have much larger wavelengths. Um, but then when we got to Mars and we found large ripples with, uh, uh, with not uh, coarse sediment, with just regular um, beach sand, uh, then it kind of confused that theory. Um, and so I don't have a great answer for you, um, but there is, there's a lot of, uh, of work that's going on to determine whether that's a grain size, um, a product of the grain size, a product of the wind flow, um, potentially just the feedback of, of uh, it's kind of an aerodynamic feedback that causes that wavelength, um, at least for dunes. It's thought to be really a, a feedback in the atmosphere itself. It's not really related to the properties of the sediment. Um, but for ripples, I think it's a little bit more confusing. Um, and there does seem to be, now that we see on Mars that there's actually a range in these ripple sizes that you can get, um, it's kind of making everyone rethink how, um, how these wavelengths form. Okay. Um, Chris Spain asks, uh, asked, if the wind isn't strong enough to move an antenna from your, your movie clip, uh, is it strong enough to adversely affect the uh, quadcopter? That is a great question. Um, so that I think is to be determined. So the current, um, as far as I know, the current plan with the quadcopter is uh, to first try to get a handle on what the wind is like in that uh, location, which is not easy as I've shown here. Um, but when we have somewhat of a sense of that, um, to do the first flights during a time that we think is relatively quiet. Um, and then basically progress from there Mind to, to riskier and riskier conditions. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how they actually uh, make that happen because I think sometimes it's easy enough to say, oh, we'll determine what when is the, the most uh, quiescent and then we'll fly the, the copter during that time. Uh, but it doesn't end up always being that easy. So I think there is gonna be um, some sort of risk, especially when it's actually flying higher in the atmosphere. Um, wind speed is, is higher um, when you go up, and so it may affect it in some, uh, in some way, although I would, would hope that the engineers that, that put it together were thinking that through. <laughs> I'm yeah. not, not, not an expert on that, but, um, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, so just if, last couple of things here. Um, what is the strict definition between uh, of the difference between dust and sand? Um, it's mostly a size thing is how we refer to it. Um, they are also, technically they are different mineralogically, um, but we have in Aeolian studies, we often, uh, we have sort of a, a scale of, uh, of what kind of dust to, to sand, to pebbles, to granules, to rocks. Um, right. And so it's, it's really a, a size thing. So uh, dust can be uh, whatever, a, a couple microns in size um, and sand is a couple hundred microns in size. Okay. Okay, so a, a couple orders of magnitude. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, did you use stereo imaging uh, and photogrammetry to make the, to try to 3D model the dunes? Uh, on Mars yeah. or on Earth? Yeah, on, on Mars. <laughs> Um, there has been work that's been done to do that. Um, and so that's another way that you can, um, usually when we take change detection images, if we can get stereo Im uh, images, we do that. Um, and if you can actually trap, uh, track the ripples moving uh, in stereo images, then you're actually much more likely to, to know the volume of sand that moved. Um, and so that's, um, that's, that's something that's useful to know. Uh, we don't always get those, but we we do use them uh, when they exist. And actually, I was asking uh, if you meant on Earth or Mars, because during this great sand dunes trip, we we also took uh, stereo images of these ripples, um, which helps helps understand how mega ripples form and and sort of their relationship to the smaller impact ripples around them. So we use it on both planets. <laughs> great, great. And then um, Alan uh, Goldberg, our vice president. Uh, asks, you know, can you learn anything from two measurables? Number one, uh, the change in the distribution of particle sizes as you move away from an erosional source. And then okay. number two, Alan was also thinking about the spacing of the ripples, which tend to be related to the Reynolds number. Yes, okay, so um, the first question, um, so as you move away from an erosional source, um, I'm not quite sure what, Maybe he can enlighten me yeah, what he please if you can yeah, I was um thank you, Maria. Um, I, I was just thinking that 
um, it, it, by analogy with Earth, these sands are coming from rock deposits right. by some sort of erosional process, either ancient. Now, they may be totally mixed by now, but and, and I know you haven't moved around much of the geography yet, but I'm wondering if you would expect to find a distribution, a difference in the distribution of particle sizes as you move from highlands towards basins, basically, that would right. tell you some idea of how fast the sand is moving over long, long periods of time. That's interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has done um, studies like that, and I don't even know from orbit if you, because um, obviously we can we can use thermal inertia to to understand what the grain sizes are, but I don't know what the resolution of those um, of what of those measurements are. So I don't know if you can discern the small changes in in grain size, um, whether or not you'd be able to tell on uh, a, a, a hundred micron sand from a one millimeter micron sand. Um, I'm not sure if if anyone has looked into that. Um, it's an interesting question. I do think it's it is hard because obviously we're uh, we're looking at sediment that we don't know if it uh, was derived locally or came from another source. And so, as you said, it's all kind of mixed in together at this point. So trying to kind of piece that uh, that together might be difficult. But um, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought much about that. Yeah, and the second part was similar to Chris's question about. Uh... Um, the, w the wavelength spacing of the ripples. Uh, right, and, and I do think that the Reynolds number probably uh, plays in there somehow, <laughs> as yeah. it usually does. So <laughs> everything um, plays into everything. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, there has been. Well, first off, at 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 your peak, uh, we had 118 people on listening Excellent. to what you had to say. That is, that's an astounding number. That's fabulous. Uh, a lot of interest in what you had to say for us. And as you were wrapping up, comments were flying back and forth here. Great lecture. Thank you for making science so fun. Uh, wonderful presentation. Loved it. And it's all sorts of good stuff. So oh, great. Uh, you, you, you rocked. Yeah. <laughs> this has been so fun. It's a, it's a great way to spend my Sunday night. <laughs> well, it's a thrill to have you. And um, Peter, how are things looking? Uh, for a remote viewing session at this point. Hi, so great talk, Dr. Baker. Um, I enjoyed it. So unfortunately, the mo there's enough moisture close by that yep. by the time we open, uh, we could be at risk of getting some sprinkles. So I'm not going to open tonight. Not but we could show you a quick view if you wanted of the telescope with the dome closed. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, okay. if, if you can, it'd be great. We'll and have our friends from up north be able to see what what toys you get to play with. Sure thing. All awesome. right. So I'm going to click present now, and sure. I'm going to pick a window here, and hopefully that'll work. Okay. Uh, you should see my screen now. Can you confirm? It is coming up. There it is. Yeah. All right. So this is our. Um, I'm actually, this is not my desktop. This is actually the desktop of the computer in the control room. Let me start by showing you a view of these live webcam views. Um, in the lower left, we have our dome. It sits on the top of Research Hall on the Fairfax campus. And in the upper left, we have a web, live webcam view of inside the dome. You can actually see a clear plexiglass cover showing the declination axe motor and reed head uh, there. Um, and in the upper right, we have our control room, so we really are using it remotely. But the computer that we're looking at right now is the one in the um, upper left uh, of that view. Uh, and just for a sense of scale in the lower left, you can see a doorway there. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tuck this over in the corner and bring up some of our other software. Let me change the view quality here. Great. And so we use the SkyX uh, to control our telescope. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom out here and show you our virtual sky. And it would have been great to look at Jupiter and Saturn tonight if uh, we could. But what I'm going to do right now for you is I'm going to point the telescope uh, to the camera so we can take a look at it and watch it move. It's going to warn us, and we'll go ahead and, and watch it turn towards us. 
And so the, the view on the left is our virtual night sky, uh, the SkyX software, which I'm sure many of you are, some of you are familiar with, some of you are not. Uh, and it, that yellow dot represents uh, the view of the, the point where the telescope is pointed, long story short. So I'm going to bring it down towards the horizon and point it at the webcam so we can get a look at inside the um, telescope tube. So we can see the telescope tube, and at the top we see this kind of metal, weird-looking structure. That's actually a structure that holds our secondary mirror in place. And it looks like I overshot where I had the point, so I'm going to pull it back once that's done. Uh, but that you can see the back of the secondary mirror there. It looks like we're in place. And I'm going to go ahead and do another move here. Oops. So now we see the primary mirror coming into view uh, uh, and inside the telescope tube. So the light comes in through that opening uh, when the weather is permitting and then bounces off that big mirror that we see in the uh, in the bottom of the tube and then bounces off the, the top secondary mirror here and then goes through a hole uh, on the back of the mirror. And now I'm gonna show you what's on the back side of the mirror. So I'm gonna pop over here and flip the telescope over. And while that's doing that, I'll also bring up our dome control software and connect to that and spin the dome a little bit. You see the weights, uh, these are counterbalance weights to help um, uh, counterbalance the stuff on the back. There we go. And it looks like it's connecting. Great. And I'm going to go ahead and home the telescope so we can watch the dome spin. There it goes. And once again, we see that declination motor that moves the telescope up and down. It's spinning primarily along the, what we call the right ascension or hour angle our angle motor. It's a fork mounted telescope um, and that fork points in the direction of Polaris. Uh, the north is basically up and to the right in this camera view. And now we see the back of the telescope uh, primary mirror starting to come into view. Park the dome again. And when the light comes through uh, the, the hole in the primary mirror after bouncing off the secondary mirror, there's actually a third mil uh, mirror inside this silver cylinder. And that's what we call a tertiary or third mirror. And it spins. So we can send a light to one of four different directions. Uh, in the lower left, we have an eyepiece. Uh, in the upper portion there, we have a low resolution spectrograph. Uh, and in the, um, the big kind of roundish square is a filter wheel in, in front of our digital camera. Oh boy, I need to abort that move. Uh, that's not doing what it should do. I think I went too far. Let's move it back up. Wait for it to finish. There we go. Went a little too far there. That normally doesn't happen. That was a very strange... Uh, move. And now you can see a nice clear view of the back of the primary mirror. And just to show you some of the, the views of things we can look at in better weather conditions, I'll go ahead and park this and go over to our uh, folder here, showing you some of our views. So here's actually a view coming up. Let me move this to the side. Keep an eye on it this time. Um, and let's minimize that. Uh, here's actually a view we took just the other night. Uh, I think this was last night. I had a student that was testing our um, focus mechanism. This just happens to be, it looks like pretty close to the galactic plane. There's a lot of bad pixels. So it might've been a, uh, a long exposure image. Zoom in, and these are so. This was a picture from yesterday, um, or maybe a couple nights ago. I don't, I'm not exactly sure. 
And uh, so we use Maxim DL to control our camera. Our telescope was built in 2000, the dome was installed in 2007. The telescope went in a decade ago uh, and we've had a, a lot of uh, exciting um, observations pretty much every clear night. So let's take a look at some nebula. One of my favorites here is the uh, ring nebula. We normally have a color version of it. There it is. And this is a star uh, like our sun that uh, went out with a whimper and expelled its outer, outer layers uh, as it ran out of hydrogen and helium diffused in its core, leaving behind a white dwarf, uh, the exposed carbon core of that star. And that's the ring nebula taken in a three color image with our campus telescope. Crab nebula. So let me bring up this version of the crab. There we go. Oh my. Yeah, that's a nice one. Um, and let's go to some galaxies. We've got a a nice one here of uh, M51. Uh, this is a spiral galaxy like our own, which is colliding with a satellite galaxy. And last but not least, I'll show you some planets. Uh, so this was a version of Jupiter taken with our campus telescope. And the typical scene here, you might be wondering, how well do we do with a campus telescope on a brightly lit campus in the middle of uh, Fairfax, uh, Virginia, with a lot of DC light pollution? And as long as we stick to bright stuff, it's not so bad. Uh, John McDowell asked, asked a good question, average exposure. I, if I had to guess, I'd say a few minutes. We do have an H alpha filter, which which helps with some of the nebula, um, uh, but um, yeah, that's briefly the the short answer there. Uh, and finally, a nice image of Saturn shown here. It looks like we've stretched it so that Saturn itself is fairly saturated or, or washed out, but you can see the the rings quite nicely there. Uh, so that includes our virtual tour. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions I missed in the chat. I don't think so, Peter. Good. Wow, great. thank you. Yeah, and hopefully you could come back in a future um, Novak meeting and we'll open up and uh, show you more. Uh, thank you for uh, having a look at our telescope tonight. Oh, you're most welcome. Yeah. So before we break for the night, uh, first off, thank you everybody who came. It was wonderful to have to have everybody here. Um, and you know, Dr. Baker, thank you so much. Um, we hope we can have you back in a year or so. And you know, when you've got some more data, we'll see uh, you know see what you've learned in in, in a year's time or so. And Peter, uh, appreciate very much the the virtual tour of the of of the facility and some of the images that you that you guys had. Uh, Dr. Parks, nice to meet you. We look forward to being face to face one of these days. And uh, everyone, have a good evening. And hopefully, we'll see some of you on Tuesday. If you're interested in volunteering as a as as, as an officer for the club uh, for the next year, and then in two weeks on Sunday afternoon, uh, for folks who are new members or folks who are you know who feel that you're amateurish. Uh, and have some questions that you want to get answered about uh, about Novak or about observing in general. Anyway, have a good evening, everybody. Take care. Good night.